Micah Jesse here for Who Say, and joining me now is a woman of many, many talents, Janet Mock. It's so good to see you again. Oh, thanks for hyping up my ego. I yes, <laughs> welcome to Who Say. Thanks for having me. We fight to be seen without compromise. We live in a world that tells so many people that they're not enough. I'm here to tell you that you are. In that clip that we just watched, um, you say that we fight to be seen without compromise. And I feel like that's a trend whenever I've heard you speak. And um, you, you said that growing up, everyone around you was rebutting you, and that there was one person growing up early on, around age 12 or 13, right, named Wendy, um, who you said saw you. And I felt like that was very powerful. Can you tell us what that means and what that felt like? Um, I think, I, you know, Wendy's so pivotal in my life journey and story. You know, she did my makeup today. Mm. So she's just like, she's just, a, she's always been so useful yeah. for me. But um, I think so much of what I struggled with as a young person was a sense of the world telling me and narrating to me who I was supposed to be and me knowing mm -hmm. deep inside, um, just in conversations with myself, who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's something that I've, I've always tried to fight and push for um, as a trans activist, as a journalist, was a sense of allowing people this space to show up as they are mm -hmm. without, without apology, without compromise, without having to kind of code switch in mm -hmm. any kind of way. And so for me with the trans list, it's like trying to create a space for folk, 11 people, to show up and give testimony. Mm -hmm. And I am so grateful to those people for for um, trusting me with their stories and then in fact then trusting the world with their their testimony true and then hair has a very special power and when you walked in today you you walk in with with such elegance and such power mm -hmm. just being who you are That's and sweet. yeah it, it, we all felt it it's like a specific energy that when somebody when somebody enters a room um, and I want to talk about hair especially yours because that has a huge impact on your story right so when you were younger I read that um, someone came to your house looking for someone named uh, Keisha, is that right? <laughs> yes. Keisha. I was trying it. Yeah. And you, you were trying it. <laughs> and your father was like, there ain't no Keisha here. Mm -hmm. And that's when he shaved your head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that really struck me because hair, like I said, has so much power. And that was your only sense of womanhood at the time that you mm -hmm. could, you know, ex exude who you wanted to be inside, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted you to talk about that a little bit and, and how that affected you and how hair, you know, to you today has so much power. Um, for me, you know, just as a, a mixed girl, mixed black girl from Hawaii, um, hair is just one of those bizarre political things. Like I like to call it freedom hair, meaning that we have the freedom to do with our hair whatever we want, where that means to relax, to weave, to braid, to blow out, to curl, to, you know, add some magic hair, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's just one of the ways in which I was able to express my gender, especially as a young person. There was so little that I had control of, right? Because in our culture, we see children as um, extensions of their parents, as property mm -hmm. and responsibility of their mm -hmm. parents. And so mm -hmm. your parents often strip you of your agency, strip you of um, means and ways of being able to express who you know you are. Mm -hmm. The way in which we adorn our bodies mm -hmm. is, is vital and important to being able to express our identities, to put ourselves forward into the world. And so for me, hair was just one of those ways. So much was lip smackers and all the other uh, um, little toiletries that I yeah. had. And, you know, even in the film, The Trans List, we constantly were having people tell their particular stories. Bambi Salcedo in the film talks about um, the idea of putting on this white dress for the first time and all the little birdies chirping at her and talking to her as if she was Cinderella. We had um, Amos Mack in the film who talks about the idea of being forced to shop in the girls' department at Kmart mm -hmm. um, and then not being able to have to do that anymore mm -hmm. was so freeing. And so the sense of who we are and how we adorn our bodies and what that says about us, it's such a, it's a, a personal statement, but I think it's also a political one. And mm -hmm. I think that what trans people do specifically, and the reason why so many people are interested in trans stories because it's a visual story mm -hmm. oftentimes. And so the sense of how we adorn our bodies becomes a political statement mm -hmm. in and of itself. And then it also then, I think, um, especially for those of us who are gender non-conforming, mm -hmm. um, meaning like non-binary folk, mm -hmm. um, the way in which they adorn their body challenges mm -hmm. all we know about gender and about expression and about orientation and about identity. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that 
in the ways in which we operate and exist in the world that we constantly challenge, but at mm -hmm. the same time, we center our own gaze, mm -hmm. our own sense of how we want to have ourselves seen in the mm -hmm. world, and not so much performing or adapting or shifting ourselves for a wider culture that's telling us you should look this way and be this way. 100%, and you said once that owning who you are is power. Mm. How does one own who I they are? I just love that you're quoting me to myself. I, girl, like, I, 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 I'm I, like, wow, she's so smart is, and amazing. Well, no, the truth <laughs> is, is that you're incredibly well-spoken mm. and you, and just by doing my research on you and, and, and knowing you as a friend, but mm. um, just it's, it's inspirational for non-trans and trans alike mm. because you are so poised, you're so elegant and you're so well-spoken oh, and you, you are an educated person coming out and being powerful and owning who you are. And it's inspirational to, like I said, both trans and non-trans alike. Mm. But I wanna find out that's challenging. I mean, to own who I was just as a gay man mm. growing up, I mean, I loved Barbies. I loved swimming, I loved gymnastics, I loved everything that the boys didn't like. Mm. Wait, were you a gymnast? I was. Oh my God, yes. really? I can do a cartwheel. That's like one of my favorite, I, I always <laughs> had these bizarre fantasies of like when people ask you like, what's your talent? I usually say singing, but I've always wished that I could do a back Oh yeah, I mean it's, look, it's, I got the Chanel uh, Olympics <laughs> going on, I'm ready. <laughs> but like it seems like such a leap of faith, like people talk about this sense of leap of faith, but like this, I know there's skill and talent and craft behind it, but like this leap of faith of having to like, you're flipping your body over. Like, I don't know. It yeah. just seems, it's just like one of those things. Well, let's that I've talk always... about leap of faith mm. for a second because um, in your life, you've taken many leaps of faith. And I want to go back to that whole idea of owning who you are as mm -hmm. power. Um, in order to own who you are, you must take a leap of faith. Um, what, what, what was the pivotal moment for you where you feel like, you took a leap of faith and it changed you for the greater? Um, I think for me it had to be in 2011 when I was, at the time I was working as an editor at People Magazine. I'm a digital editor and I was comfortable, I got a good living wage I'm in New York City, I was reporting on the things that I wanted to report, mm -hmm. report on in culture and entertainment. I was comfortable but I think that there was something inside of me that was telling me that it was time to step forward and um, bring all of myself to the table. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean to own who you are, mm -hmm. right? But it was scary at the same time because I was also being, I was also afraid that maybe if I stepped forward, things would be taken away from me. All the things that I had had mm -hmm. access to at that time as a young woman would be stripped from me. And so, but I decided to, to lean on storytelling and to lean on telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has changed the trajectory of my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, stepping forward in that Marie Claire article, and then now working as an editor at Marie Claire and being able to write mm -hmm. cover stories for them and being able to interview everyone from um, Nicki Minaj to Trayvon Martin's mother, mm -hmm. Sabrina Fulton, to being able to do that work. I would not be able to do that work mm -hmm. if I didn't take that leap of faith, mm -hmm. if I didn't tell the truth, if I didn't, um, if I didn't step forward and just own it. And for me, what's so um, interesting around that too is also then I have to contextualize that mm -hmm. because I had been given access to so many things as a young person. I had access to education. Mm -hmm. I was able-bodied. I was able to um, get access to you know the medical care that I needed at a young age. I stood on the shoulders of giants who advocated and did activist work long before I even mm -hmm. existed that enabled me to, to have access to all those mm -hmm. things. So for me, that leap of faith w wasn't so much a personal thing. It was also a political thing in the mm -hmm. sense of this this is, I, I think it's, um, who says it? I think it's um, Alice Walker says that um, activism is the rent that I pay to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. And so for me, stepping forward and doing that, that making that proclamation, standing in my truth, was my first form of political um, conscious raising for myself. Mm -hmm. It was like my political statement. Mm -hmm. It's similar to the way in which, you know, Gloria Steinem in the 70s where she stepped forward and said, I had an abortion, yeah. right? It's like we all make these statements that come from ourselves and that then I think also rallies us and rallies people around us to be able to say, I belong to all of these amazing people. Yeah. I, I stand alongside these people. I work alongside these people. You have the power of making some a, a statement that could be very long-winded. <laughs> Good luck, editor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and shortening and shortening it into something so powerful. So that Marie Claire article that you just mentioned was titled "I Was Born a Boy," mm. and I want to read a passage because I found it so powerful when I was when I was reading it. You said, and, and you were referring to when you were going to to do the um, the assignment surgery. Mm -hmm. You said, at the arrival gate, I was greeted by two smiling nurses who assured me that everything was going to be okay. 
But I already knew that. I was the one who had lived with the sheer torment of inhabiting a body that never matched who I was inside. The one devastated by the quirk of fate that had consigned me to a life of masked misery. Can you talk about that a little bit? I can only imagine what that feeling was like when you're getting off the plane and about to do something that's so transformative, but mm. it'd been something that you'd been preparing for for years. And I think what's so interesting about that piece, you know, I didn't write that piece. It was an interview that was then used into my words gotcha. and made into a first person story. And there's a lot of controversy around that piece and the way in which it was titled and the editor came forward and oh. talked about it and okay. all that stuff. Um, but in the Marie Claire piece, and I think the moment you're talking about, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the moment you're talking about in that piece, um, for me it wasn't so much it wasn't as scary because other women that I had known who were mm -hmm. in my life had already gone there mm -hmm. and done that. And so that's the power of community, right? The sense of someone telling you and experiencing the world and having probably before been the only person and to then open the door and to tell you, this is the way to show you how to get to your own sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. And so what that was, that journey going to Thailand alone mm -hmm. as an 18 year old, um, I was taking care of myself, but I also had people behind me who were taking care of me, mm -hmm. who gave me the blueprint, who showed me like, this is the track that you follow, this is the lane, and you can find your girl there, mm -hmm. whatever that means for you. And for so many trans folk, um, you know, medically transitioning is vital and important. Mm -hmm. um, reproductive justice is vitally important. Mm -hmm. Um, but for a lot of folk, there's no need to adapt or shift their bodies, mm -hmm. right? A medical transition is not a part of their journey. Mm -hmm. And what I constantly try to do in the work that I'm doing is complicate that narrative because for so long, from the 1950s all the way to present day, we've been obsessed with, um, with the notion of what trans people do to their bodies and not so much around the idea of what it means to then exist in this body mm -hmm. as a trans person in this culture that is constantly questioning you, mm -hmm. constantly asking you to legitimize yourself, constantly telling you you don't belong here, constantly telling you like the hundreds of trans women who are killed around the globe every year mm -hmm. that you should not exist because I cannot get my mind wrapped around your identity. Mm -hmm. And what I constantly tell people is that the way in which I present in the world, the way in which I identify takes nothing away from you. Mm -hmm. So why are you so shook? You know what I mean? Like it, it is, it's something that you need to deal with. That's your issues. Mm -hmm. Me existing in the world takes nothing away from you. Awesome, and then you've denounced the way the media tend to sensationalize transgender stories. What do you think can be done mm. to positively impact the way that the media covers transgender stories? I think one of the number one things that the media can do is hire trans folk to be the leaders of those stories. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried to just do, I've tried to do the work of challenging that not just by you know writing essays and stuff, but also by actually just doing the work and mm -hmm. showing people that I have the access and I can show up and I can produce projects like the trans list mm -hmm. and create um, the affirmative stories that I didn't have growing up. And that's my whole mission is to be able to do that. But I think what, what's essential is going to the source. I mm -hmm. think that as pure as, uh, for me as a journalist, is the idea of ensuring that our newsrooms are inclusive as diverse as mm -hmm. the people that we're reporting on. Mm -hmm. So why is it that constantly we have like a columnist like Nicholas Kristof going out into the world in the New York Times and reporting on marginalized people and then just making them seem as if like they're the, these points of tragedy and trauma. Mm -hmm. Like why can't someone who has been through that, who has the skills to write and report, go and do that? Someone who has had a mother who was in prison to go and do that work. And we try to demean it by saying that, oh, this is citizen journalism if it's someone who comes with a particular perspective. Mm -hmm. It's not objective, it's not as pure. Mm -hmm. But what's so pure about a complete stranger not knowing this world, coming in and reporting on this world? Mm -hmm. The fish out of water thing is not completely necessary. We have people who have the tools, who have, and when we talk about tools, we're not just talking about journalistic skills of being able to write and report. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the skills of empathy, the skills of, of lived experience, mm -hmm. the skills of having lived intersectional, complicated lives. Mm -hmm. Let those people go out in the world and tell us those stories. It'll be a lot more challenging, it'll lift us up, and it'll also take us away from this sense of like, oh, this is something that I'm experiencing mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing, but also something that I'm really engaged in feeling and changing because I'm seeing this person tell their story. Awesome, and then, of course, we wanna talk more about the trans list coming out on HBO. A girl will pivot every three seconds. Honey. Like, and then the trans list. <laughs> well, we wanna talk about the trans list. Um, you co-produced and conducted all the interviews for. Mm -hmm. Now, conducting interviews for you is, is 
not a new thing. You mm. did it on your show on MSNBC and you've done it for a number of different outlets. But I want to find out what did you learn mm. about yourself or perhaps as a producer or as a journalist from making this film? I think I really truly learned the power of collaboration. What you realize is that, you know, this project is not just about me and the interviews or the subjects, it's about like a whole crew of people who are working together and challenging and pushing and arguing with each other. And that's what we did every single day on this project. We, um, I was in the Outlist in um, 2012, the Timothy Greenfield Sanders um, film on uh, the LGBT community, and I was the only trans person in that mm. film. And I wrote an essay uh, tied to um, its release on HBO about um, being the only trans person and wishing that there were other folk in there. There was only one bi person as well, which was Cynthia Nixon. Mm -hmm. And Sam McConnell, who's a fellow producer with me and was also on the Outlist, he um, told me, he was like, let's do a trans list because of that essay. Mm -hmm. And so then we went into production and the di most difficult thing for me was choosing 11 people mm -hmm. out of a community that's so vast and diverse and not monolithic mm -hmm. um, to tell a story of what, not a story, but 11 stories. Um, and so it was hard to like encompass the entire trans experience. Yeah. <laughs> How many submissions did you have to go through? I came up with a list of 150 names in an Excel sheet that listed folks' names, their age, what generation they transitioned in, their location, their economic background, whether they've been incarcerated, engaged in sex work, all of the things, yeah. like so that we could tell the most diverse story as and possible. And of course, <laughs> you know, well, and, and of course, when it comes to the media, having notable names like Laverne Cox mm -hmm. and, and names like yourself help sell out a film, mm -hmm. you know? But there were people in that in the documentary that some people have never heard their stories mm -hmm. before. So I, I, it's really incredible and uh, everyone should check it out on HBO. It, it's already premiered. Yeah. So exciting. <laughs> um, I know you, we don't want to talk too much love life, but I know that you're happy in love. Mm -hmm. And um, I just recently got engaged. Oh my God, congratulations. <laughs> I know, just had oh to throw yes. that in there. but. Um, <laughs> Because we're talking about wedding, of course, in the in the Aww. office. Um, did you ever imagine having a wedding as a young kid? Um, I didn't really imagine getting married or having. I think that because I never saw that narrative for me, even though I was obsessed with it. You know, my favorite book in the entire world is Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. And in the book, it's about a woman who's on a quest to find self, mm -hmm. but also to find love and fulfillment and self-realization. And um, in the film, she gets married three times. Um, she never has a ceremony or a wedding, right, but right. she's married three times. And I remember thinking about the wanting to find that kind of love. I always thought finding love was possible, but being a bride was never a part of my own personal narrative. Mm -hmm. It was something that really became a reality when I met my husband, and um, it was something that was very important to him. And it was important to me to, to build and, and create and um, protect this very private, um, thing between us, but mm -hmm. our family, what our family unit is. Awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to doing the yeah. same. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, after the election, we've got to talk politics a little bit. Um, you said that we have a better option, and it's us, and we have to do the work now. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh my god, I said that? When did I say that? So oh my well. god, when did I say that? <laughs> I don't saying but that. it's powerful that, mm. that we, people that are not in politics, mm. people uh, that are not on television, that don't necessarily have mm -hmm. a voice. We have work to do on ourselves. We have self-reflection to do. We have to look in the mirror and say, how did we contribute to this result? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that way? I mean, if, if, if you didn't say that, do you feel no, that I way? Think, I'm, no, I'm sure I said <laughs> it, but I'm just like. <laughs> if you didn't though, do you feel <laughs> that way? <laughs> but I think I have, I've always believed in the power of the people. For me, electoral politics is uninteresting and so boring. Mm -hmm. um, I had never really been engaged. I've always voted. My first election that I voted in, the presidential election, was Kerry versus Bush. Mm -hmm. I had been a disillusioned right away from my first voting process. Um, but I've always exercised the right to vote because I know that so many people had fought for that. It mm -hmm. was the people who fought for that. And so for me, I always vote. But at the same time, it's like I also know that it's up to the people to hold those in power accountable. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do now is that we need to activate. We need to ensure that we're rallying around each other, that we're taking care of each other, that we're giving our money to grassroots organizations that are doing by and for and led work in mm -hmm. communities that are 
utterly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's making sure that Planned Parenthood has the money that they need, that the ACLU has the money that they need, but also that organizations like Miss Major Griffin Gracie's organization, mm -hmm. TGIJP is funded, that SRLP in New York City is funded. So making sure that those organizations are as strong as possible that, so that they can resist the backlash that's coming, mm -hmm. um, that, that's already here. Mm -hmm. But I think also what's powerful about being part of so many marginalized communities as a woman, as a person of color, and as a trans person is that I have never really been centered in any politics, mm -hmm. in any politician's agenda. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I've always relied on the power of the people and the power of the people have told me and, and taken care of me. And so what I need to do is ensure that those people with the access that I have are being uplifted and taken care of as well. Mm -hmm. And so we need to go to a system and a model of communal care. Mm -hmm. And what about though, I'm, I'm taking my mind back to when I was a kid and mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily have a credit card to swipe online and, and donate to a you know the Trevor Project or the ACLU mm -hmm. like you mentioned. What do you say to the youth out there that don't have the resources, don't have the, uh, uh, I forget what word They have used. so many resources though. They have the resources of volunteering your time. Mm -hmm. Right, so like when we talk about donating, I don't just think money, but money is very vital and important mm -hmm. for these organizations to run. But it's also being active, right? So like with so much of what we talk about in the ally space is like you know allies educating themselves and taking that education about themselves, but also then using the new knowledge that they have mm -hmm. to go out and be at even jealous mm -hmm. for uh, marginalized folk, right? Going out and doing the work of getting your people. You know, so many um, liberal white people are upset and angry and saying that. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna talk to those people, but it's like what you need to do right now is go and go get your people and go talk to those white rural working class folk mm -hmm. who don't know, who mm -hmm. are not having these conversations, who don't know undocumented folk, who don't know disabled folk, who don't know queer and trans people. You need to go out and talk to those people mm -hmm. and get them and educate them and have these difficult conversations. That's mm -hmm. the, the most vital thing. But young people, young people have so much power and they have so many resources, the resources of time and intelligence and building community. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the first times that I felt politically active was when I had my trans group in high school. Mm -hmm. And we did work. We went out, we read to young people. We, we were able to do things that even though we were poor and we had nothing and we were queer and trans, we were able to go do stuff. And so young people can do that. Awesome. And then your New York Times bestseller, Redefining Realness, has just made a huge impact. Mm -hmm. uh, are we, can we expect another novel from you, another piece of literature? Yeah, I'm working on my um, second memoir right now. It's coming out in the summer and it tackles my um, my interesting 20s experience, which was largely the years in which I had already transitioned in Hawaii and all that stuff, but I was a college student, a grad student, and a young professional. And what does it mean to have this experience that I'm not so much public and open about, but mm -hmm. having it color and shift and shape everything that, that I knew and experienced in the world? All right, thank you, Janet. Please tune in to The Trans List on HBO, Monday, December 5th at 8 p.m. everywhere. Everywhere. Gotta watch it. <laughs>